Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Today we're going to be talking about um, Can Do Equine, basically what Can Do Equine is all about and what led me to hear what I do, why I do it and that sort of thing. And somebody is just asking the questions that, you know, do I have any tips on building confidence? And it's a really interesting question to start off today's webinar because that is actually what Can Do Equine is all about. And it's not a, just about building riding confidence because, of course, that's really important, but it's also probably even more about building a confident horse. And I think quite often that's what's missing. What Can Do Equine is all about is building confident horses, taking responsibility for your horse and therefore for your horse's training. Because the fact is that if you own that horse or if, even if you just ride that horse, perhaps you ride a school horse or something, you are responsible for what that horse goes through when you're with it. So you're even if you're just on that horse for an hour and then you get off, it's your responsibility to do the very best by that horse that you can. And if you own a horse, it's your responsibility to do the very best by that horse that you can. And that's what Can Do Equine is all about, is just giving you the tools to be able to do that. And that builds confident riders because, you know, even with the best riding instructor in the world, and that's great if you've got a good riding instructor, that's absolutely fantastic. But what you need to be able to do is really communicate well with your horse. And I think that's what's often missing with people. So when horses develop behavioural problems like bucking or bolting or rearing or things like that, um, what we need to do is break down what's happened, what's gone wrong there, and how can we build that bubble back up, um, that bubble of communication that keeps us and the horse safe. And that's what Can Do Equine is about. It's about building that bubble of communication. And, you know, Rachel's just said that who was the person that asked about building confidence that she doesn't own a horse. And so, you know, it's sort of really important for, you know, somebody like that that doesn't own a horse that is just riding maybe other people's horses or school horses that you really get to grips with this communication with the horse because, you know, it's especially difficult um, when you don't have control of what goes on with that horse at other times. So if you can, you know, that hour you spend with that horse, if you can make that the best that you can make it and you can develop some communication with that horse, that's going to be really helpful and really help for your um, confidence as well, Rachel. So just bear that in mind that, you know, if, you, if you're only riding that horse occasionally, um, all of these same things apply but it's just, you know, in a um, much sort of smaller quantity, that's all. Anyway, so I want to just talk a little bit about what led me here. Oh, is that Robin that I was just talking to from the States? Um, that's, that's good. Um, very nice to see you here. And I will talk to you after this webinar. Um, so, you know, because it's... It's a funny thing, and we all have a different journey, but eventually we, you know, we wake up and say, oh, hang on a minute, things aren't going the way I sort of thought they would go, or my horse is not behaving in the way I wanted it to go, or my, my riding isn't, you know, at the standard that I wanted it to be at. Something is missing, and that is what exactly what happened to me. And like a lot of you, you know, I grew up on the back of a horse. I went to a boarding school. I took my horse. Yeah, I rode every day, you know, from the age of however old that was. And, you know, very much had horses in my blood. And my father bred race horses. And, you know, I used to have those off the track horses and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, when you're young like that, you don't really think about much. You just get on and ride the horse. And, I think as you get older and more experienced, things sort of start to click into place for you and you start to think, I found as well, a lot more about the horse than perhaps you used to when you were younger. So what happened to me was I went from that sort of thing, that sort of riding environment and, you know, did sort of a bit of a venting, a bit of dressage, a bit of this and a bit of that, a bit of anything really. Um, and then I went to um, Hong Kong where I just rode off the track horses and then to the UK where I 
did some um, British Horse Society instructor qualifications and did a little bit of low-level eventing there and had a bit of fun. And then moved to Singapore. That was an interesting move because in Singapore at the time when I was there, you couldn't, it was very difficult to own a horse. So the horse actually belonged to the club that you were a member of. So you have very limited control of the horse. And in Singapore, I did show jumping, dressage, and played polo. So I, I, I didn't own any of those horses. Um, so the control is rather taken away from you. But I competed there up to Rolex International um, level for dressage and show jumping. And what I found then is I, I, but my very last competition, very last Rolex competition, um, I had I had won the freestyle on this horse that was just, I felt like I was holding him together. And in fact, I was holding him together because that was exactly what the instructor had yelled at me to do as I left the warm-up arena. Hold him together, lamp, wrap your legs around him, don't let him go. And so, you know, I had this much tension on his mouth, I had my legs wrapped around him, and the whole thing was so tense. And anyway, we did win it, which was crazy. But one of the judges' comments was, the horse looks beautiful on the outside, but I fear ready to explode on the inside and she she hit it on the head absolutely hit it on the head and and i just thought my gosh you know there has to be a better way than this there has to be a better way for me and for the horse and this was a horse that was interesting because a lot of the horses in singapore at that time were actually off the track thoroughbreds because it was very expensive to bring horses in so they just grab a horse off the track and use that um obviously when they retired from racing they weren't just nicking them um and so this horse had actually been taken had come into the club as a show jumper and for a few years it had been show jumping before it had been passed off and given to the dressage crew. By the time it had finished show jumping, this horse was so afraid of jumping that it actually would throw itself on the ground, literally throw itself on the ground when it saw a show jump. Now, you know, you can imagine the tension in that poor creature, what it had been through. I have no idea. But I actually took that horse to Malaysia and we used to uh, warm it up with sort of medium and advanced level dressage movements and it, we could actually take it in and do a nice little equitation show jumping around with the horse who was actually really good but you had to get his mind first back into a really safe zone and so it was there that I realized there's there's just something really missing with my communication with this horse and you know, I'm not enjoying it. The horse isn't enjoying it. You know, what, what's going wrong? And I moved from Singapore to the States. And so I thought, well, when I get to the States, the States is full of horse trainers. You know, there's got to be somebody that's, that's good, that can teach me what it is I need to know, what's missing from, from this relationship, because it is supposed to be fun, right? We're supposed to enjoy our time with the horse and the horse is supposed to enjoy the time as well. And that's what I wanted to find, that enjoyment that to me seemed to be missing. So I moved to the States and I found John Lyons. Um, and that was that was amazing. You know, he, um, he did something called conditioned response training, which was like, oh, wow, that, <laughs> that's a... Not a very sexy name for it, but I did understand that because many years before I'd done a few years of psychology at university. So I thought, oh, condition response, yeah, I, I get that. That makes sense to me. So off I went and did um, the John Lyons course. Now, that was a lot of fun because you had to bring a couple of horses with you. You had to have one that was unstarted and one that was already started. So I picked up a warm blood mare from... Um, a dressage judge that I knew he lived in Perth popped that this was the three-year-old unstarted popped that on a flight to Singapore picked up a polo pony in Singapore popped them both on a flight to Colorado and spent the eight months there in Colorado doing the John Lyons course um, and it was absolutely fabulous and what I found there was a system where I could actually 
really learn to understand and break down the things that I'm teaching the horse so that the horse could understand it and so I could understand it. Now, I can't teach the horse anything that doesn't make complete sense in my head. Like if it doesn't make sense to me, there's no way I can explain it to the horse. And that was what I was finding with the dressage, like getting to the quite high level of dressage um, when I was in Singapore was that a lot of it really didn't make sense. I remember one day um, riding a, a, a shoulder in, just a simple shoulder in down the long side. And the instructor was saying, right hand here, left leg there, push, push, push. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh. I felt like I was in a game of twister, you know, where you, you sort of walk like this. And the horse was so tense. And I'm thinking, oh, hang on a minute. Shoulder in down the long side is simply the first step of a 10 meter circle ridden straight. That's all it is. It's a three track, it's simple. And it's got to be, for me, it's got to be that clear in my head so that I can explain that to the horse. And that's really what the John Lyons course did for me. And that's now what I'm trying to do for people. So the basic sort of idea of how, um, condition response training works, breaks down to everything that I teach. Now, what I've done with that in the past decade and a half, um, because I was, in the, I was in Colorado in 2001, and so I then moved back to the UK and I started um, a company there which just brought in horses for training basically that was basically my job there equine perfection we called it and um, mostly what I did was bring horses in for training I also traveled quite a bit in the UK to doing clinics and things but mostly I brought horses in for training and that was great and it's really fun as somebody who's doing that you know as a trainer it's a lot of fun because it's very satisfying. You get these horses that don't know anything or are behaving very badly and, you know, you spend a few weeks with them and then you send them back and they're, they're lovely and it was a lot of fun for me. For the horse, I think probably not so much because I think it makes it quite difficult for the horse. The problem is and what I've found and why I've stopped completely taking horses in for training is that when you train a horse, you are building that bubble of communication. So when I take your horse in for training, I'm building a bubble of communication and I'm in there with the horse. I'm getting the horse in the engagement zone. I'm teaching the horse all these different cues. When I give the horse back to you, you have to do the same thing. You have to build that bubble of communication your cues are going to be slightly different from mine. And so what I found was it's really very hard on the horse. Um, you know, I can get the horse doing X, Y, and Z, but then I give it back to you. And if you don't know how the horse learned that, if it starts to go wrong, then you're not going to know how to repair that. So the horse has to go through all these learning curves, which is really unfortunate for the horse. Um, and, the, you know, they're not like motorbikes or computer programs we can't put this stuff on the horse you know people talk about installing buttons on the horse the horse doesn't have buttons the horse has behavioral responses to cues um, and it's unrealistic and unfair on the horse to think of it like a button you know installing a button because that's something you do you know with something mechanical like a car you can install a electric window on a car and every time you press that button the same response is going to happen the window is going to go down it's not the same with a horse you know i might put a cue on the horse for canter let's say that's a kiss cue I make that sound the horse canters now when i give the horse back to you and i say oh the, the cue for canter is the kiss sound you know you might make a different sound. Your, your kiss might not sound the same as mine or you might not want to use that cue. You might prefer a leg cue. So the horse has to go through this relearning process. If you didn't teach it and the horse has some old behavioral patterns, it will revert to those old patterns because they've worked before. And one of the things that I found about taking horses in for training is that, They've 
always got some really well-established behaviors because oddly enough, you know, people don't bring you their best horse for training. Funny, isn't it? <laughs> um, because they think that their horses are really good already, so they don't need that. What they do bring you is the horse that they have that really um, got some serious problems. And quite often I found this in the UK. It was um, I did a sort of little mental study of this and found that every person that bought me um, a horse with behavioural problems, which was every horse that came in pretty much, um, everyone that said they've got a perfect horse at home, every one of those people ended up bringing me their perfect horse. Because what happened was they, they bring the horse with the behavioural problems. So say it barks or it bolts or it does something um, or, you know, they can't get the canter on it or whatever it is. And they bring me the horse with the problems and they tell me, you know, they've got this one at home that's absolutely great, you know, it's blah, 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 can do X, Y and Z. And okay, well, that's really interesting. Okay. And so what happens is we get their problem horse going really well because and we'll discuss why in a moment and where I start. And then they say, oh, wow, well, that's really interesting. Then they bring you the really perfect horse because their expectations go up. You know, they say, oh, gosh, the problem horse can be up here. Actually, my perfect horse was better than the problem horse, but not as good as the problem horse now is. And so that was really interesting for me because we need to raise our expectations because people actually have really low expectations of their horse until they start training their own horses. And so I found a combination of those two things was that, you know, actually teaching people to train their own horse was much kinder on the horse and much easier for the owner. Um, and you had much more long lasting results that way. And also it raised people's expectations because what they realized was that horses in their training, like us in our education, it's not a static thing. It's always, you're always learning something. So whether it's good or whether it's bad, you're always, always learning something. So what's the big difference then between the way I approach horse training and the way a lot of other people approach horse training or horse riding education? And for me, the big difference is that emotional level. So that's what I found, you know, back in that Rolex international competition that I was riding in. What, what was going wrong there was the horse's emotional level was like up here. And so I had to hold the horse together because otherwise it was, as the judge suggested, going to explode. And so what's happened is that I have no control over the horse's emotional level. Now, we all know um, as learners and having been students that the emotional level that you enter the lesson with is very, very important. So we know that if you're scared, you're not learning and you're not engaged with whatever's going on around you. So, you know, if you, if you think about it as a classroom, if you're a student in a classroom and the teacher's yelling at you, you aren't learning. You're scared, you're thinking about other things, you're perhaps thinking about leaving, ways in which you can get away. And I think the horse is the same. You know, if we're in the, in the arena with the horse or the round pen with the horse or wherever we are with the horse, that's our classroom. And if your um, if the horse's emotional level is too high, if the horse is afraid, it is thinking about ways it can escape. The same problem goes if the horse is not emotional enough, like if the horse is basically asleep. So if you're in the classroom, you've got a really boring teacher, you know, who's not engaging and not telling an interesting story, just doing algebra or something, and you're staring out the window, you are not engaged, you are not going to remember anything. It's the same problem with us with the horse in the round pen or in the arena. If we aren't engaging, if we aren't making it fun, then the horse is not going to be engaging with us, is not going to be learning. And as an owner, which also means you are your horse's trainer, it's our job to be engaging. It's our job to make it fun for the horse. And that is half the battle. And if you get a horse that's been 
systematically desensitized to pressure, which, you know, you will find a horse, like a school horse or a horse that um, doesn't respond to pressure. I had somebody uh, ring me up the other day and they were trying to teach hips to the fence. They were tapping their horse on the hip with the whip and the horse was just not responding at all. So they were gradually increasing the pressure and the horse was still just not responding at all. And this horse had been systematically desensitized to pressure and it was getting it was getting worse because the horse was just standing there and every now and then the owner would think, oh gosh, you know, I can't sort of smack it any harder. So they'd stop for a minute and think about that and then they'd start again. And so the horse is actually being taught even more to stand still because we talk a lot about pressure release, but we don't always think this through, you know, what the pressure is and when to release because the release is the important thing, which we were talking about last week in the positive and negative reinforcement. So it is really important that we're aware of that. And so I think that that emotional level is um, so important and so overlooked you know, so it's all very well to have a great riding instructor who's telling you how to sit on the horse and how to balance. You can practice your balance and you can do all of that. But if your horse is nervous when you're riding it and its head's up here, which is probably going to mean that its back is very hollow, then no amount of you putting your heels down or, you know, relaxing or doing anything else is going to make a sitting trot easy or safe. Yeah. It really isn't. What you need to do is you need to get your horse into your bubble of communication, get your horse into the engagement zone where the horse can relax. So we've got to start with relaxation. And I'm not sure what happened to relaxation. You know, it seems to have gone out the window. We It used to be that it was, you know, the most important thing to start with in dressage. But now, you know, it would seems we don't really care one way or another. But if you don't start with relaxation, if you don't begin training your horse with a horse relaxed, then you're never going to be successful. Because, and let's just think about relaxation. I mean relaxation of the mind, but also of the body. And we look at modern dressage and we see, you know, the horse with the really tight nose band, for example. If you think about that, if you clamp your jaw closed, um, just do it for a sec while we're talking, you know, like that. Teeth together, clamp your jaw closed, which is how tight, tight nose bands are on horses. You can feel that tension after about 30 seconds. You can feel the tension go from here all the way down and actually within a minute it will reach your toes and just think about that level of tension. And that's what we're doing to dressage horses when we do things like that, when we clamp their mouths closed or when we hold that good contact you know all of those sorts of things we're creating all this tension and I think it's really important um so I'm just reading it because oh yeah I'm, I will come to that and the question was why do you think people are so resistant to the idea that they can train their own horses um so we're, we're building all this tension which makes it very very difficult for the horse to learn because it can't relax so if unless you start with relaxation, I think you're on a hiding to nothing. And, um, yeah, Robin's question about why people are resistant to training their own horses, I think a lot of it comes from that sort of white coat thing. Um, you know, we, we always think somebody else is better than we are. Um, and what I encourage people to do before they send their horse anywhere out to a trainer is to watch that trainer ride. Because if you actually watch some of these people ride, there is no way you would let them near your horse. Um, but we always assume that somebody else does it better than we do. I also think that people, a lot of people have this belief still that horses need to be ridden through stuff. There's this old cowboy thing, you know, where you just get on, let them buck it out and all of this sort of thing. So you need some sort of cowboy, some sort of really good rider to 
get your horse through that. And of course, it's nonsense. It's actually worse than nonsense because quite often it's really frightening for the horse. Um, anything that the horse has to sort out for itself, it's most unlikely to work out in a good way, you know, for us. So let's take the example of first saddling for a horse. Now, if you have a look inside the, um, my training, there's a first saddling module in there. And there's the classic way, right at the beginning there, I'll show you what is the classic way of um, introducing the saddle to the horse. And I had a horse that somebody had done this with before I got it. And it's throw the saddle on and let the horse buck it out. And what happens is the horse, well, what is supposed to happen, what they say happens is that the horse learns that it can't get rid of the saddle. And that's the important thing, apparently, um, that the saddle is stuck on its back whether it likes it or not, no matter what it does. Um, and so therefore it accepts the saddle. Well, okay, that's actually not necessarily the case at all. We have no idea what the horse thinks about the saddle um, simply because it can't remove it. Um, although that particular horse in that module that you see bucking had learned to buck off a girthed up saddle. So, you know, that also doesn't always work. What does happen with these things is that the horse may learn that pattern. So the horse may, as this particular horse did, learn that when it's saddled, it bucks. Um, horses learn patterns really well. And a lot of the time you'll find when you do send your horses out to trainers like that um, is that they actually just work them so hard that they worked into exhaustion or they worked into learned helplessness. And this is the reason, you know, one of the main reasons I decided to stop taking horses in was because people were expecting these horses to be worked into the ground and to, you know, come back in a sort of state of learned helplessness, I think. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's just, it doesn't work like that because the horse gets home and then, you know, you have to know what the horse knows and the ha horse has to know something useful because if you work a young and educationally young horse for an hour a day, um, you're probably physically exhausting it, you're probably physically hurting it, and you're certainly mentally exhausting it. So the horse isn't taking on all that information. I'd much rather teach someone to teach their own horse, take an educationally young horse and learn that together. And I think in answer to your question, Robin, that is that people just don't have that belief in themselves because they've been told that they're not experienced enough to do it. And they haven't really looked at the people that are doing it. And they don't understand how the horse learns. And, you know, what I think is really nice is to watch the horse and the owner come along together. Because if you're not going to physically or mentally exhaust your horse, then there's no reason to be thinking that you need to work it really hard. Okay, so the reason people lunge horses before they ride quite often is to get the edge off, you know, so that the horse isn't too fresh, so the horse doesn't buck. Well, what if the horse had never been taught to buck? What if the horse understood the lesson and didn't feel the need to escape by bucking? That would be a much better starting place. And so that's what I teach. That's I teach you to take the horse from, from the beginning no matter what the horse's previous experience is, take the horse from the beginning and start building that bubble of communication. And more often than not, even with people that start with what is a problem horse that's already been bucking, if they take it right back and start at the engagement zone, start with give to the bit, start building that bubble, it's so different for that horse the horse goes, oh my God, this is completely new. And it's really interesting because these patterns of behaviour have been established, but that doesn't mean that they're there to stay. All the horse wants is a better alternative. You know, if bucking and throwing the rider off has worked in the past, the horse will use that. The horse will use it when it feels it has no other alternative. 
The thing about that sort of behavior is it's really energy expensive. So it, you know, a horse doesn't just suddenly go to bucking. You know, the horse, it will, it will do whatever it can first to, to try to get some release of pressure. The horse goes to bucking because it's forced to go to bucking. So, yes, it is harder. It's much harder to take that bucking horse back to the beginning and re-educate it. But it certainly can be done. If you've got an educationally young horse and you can set it up like this from the beginning, it's yes, it's much easier. It's absolutely much easier. Do you need to be a great rider to do that? No. No, you really don't. You need to be a great rider to ride through bucking. So once you get out of your head that that's something that has to be done, then you're, you can, you can go back with whatever horse you have and say, right, this is how we do it. This is what pressure means. This is when you get a release. And you can engage the horse's brain and engage the horse with learning. And I think, you know, that really is the big thing. And you see these horses, especially the dressage schoolmasters and um, off-the-track uh, thoroughbreds. Those are two that really stand out for me. The first thing I teach to engage the horse with learning is give to the bit. And both those dressage schoolmasters and the off the track horses have had so much unrelenting bit pressure that means nothing. You know, for the for the race horses, the bit pressure means go fast, and it means stop, and it, mean, it means nothing and everything all at once. And then quite often when they're being led, they're just being jabbed in the mouth for like no reason in particular. And the dressage schoolmasters have had a good contact being held, which is you know, probably about 10 kilograms of um, pressure in each rein um, their whole lives. And it doesn't get released because you can't give your reins as a dressage rider, oh, unless you do it for two strides in a circle, um, because you, you've got to hold your horse in place all the time. And so you start these lessons, the give to the bit lesson with the horse, with those sorts of horses, and they go, oh, wow, you're going to release that pressure? And it's amazing to see them engaged. And so you go from a horse that's been so desensitized to pressure, a horse that suddenly goes, oh, wow. So all I need to do is look for an answer. Yeah. And when I find the right answer in movement, you're going to release that pressure. You're not going to release a little bit of it. You're going to release it all. Yeah. And so it, it is wonderful to see that. And that's why I find the give to the bit work that's why i teach it first so it has a lot of other really good things about it so i'm just going to take you inside the training so we can have a quick look and i want to look at this how it comes across from the horse's point of view and so i'm going to just share the screen here let me go there let me share the screen there we are Right. Now, here we are inside the training. So I've just gone into uh, my courses and then clicked on the first one here, the horse training course. Yep. Good. So you'll see here that the first thing I do is the engagement zone um, module. Now, this is just going to take you through assessing your horse's emotional level and learning how to raise and lower it because for me that's the thing that most often goes wrong with training what happens is the horse is either too emotional or not emotional enough and it's not in that engagement zone and getting that right makes all the difference as i said earlier you know if the horse is too emotional it's not learning if the horse isn't emotional enough. It's also not learning. And so either way, it's, you know, makes it very difficult for the horse and, and for you. So we start there, which just helps you recognise, you know, where your horse is with engagement. Now, the next thing to do is to really start building that bubble. And that's why I start with the give to the bit work. Now, this is something that is useful for 
all horses, all level of rider, all level of horse. Now, the and all horses of all different experiences. I'm often asked, can I teach this in a bitless bridle? And the answer is absolutely yes, you can. I've found that you'll need a little bit more pressure, but you know, if you're careful with your release, you can certainly teach this with a bitless bridle in just the same way. Um, the, the great thing about this is that the horse not only learns to be soft in the bridle and travel in frame, but it also will um, allow the horse to elevate its shoulders and lift its back which is going to be so useful for you when you come to ride. So all of the work here and actually in all of the lessons um, can be done from the ground. So if you've got a young horse or if you've got a new horse or if you've got a horse that's been off work for a while, then all of these lessons can be done from the ground. This horse is an unstarted horse. The other thing we do is we look at a lot of different horses throughout because they are all a bit different. Now, this horse is an Andalusian, an Andalusian quarter horse. What an odd mix. But um, horses and disciplines, you know, we all want slightly different carriage. So, you know, for an Andalusian, you might want quite a high head carriage. For a quarter horse, you might want quite a low head carriage. It will depend on your discipline. But, you know, it's just a matter of releasing at the right time. So the beauty of starting with this particular module is that it gives us softness in the bridle and um, I think this, this is a bit of a funny one, this Appaloosa horse. Um, it gives us softness in the bridle, but it gives us the horse's attention and it also teaches the horse about pressure release. Because quite often with horses, this will be the first lesson that they ever sort of learn about pressure release. I used to always put horses in the round pen, but I don't actually think that that's at all necessary because it's quite a good place also to teach pressure release. But not all of us have a round pen, so that's it's not really necessary. This is a great place to engage your horse with learning, get your horse into the engagement zone and teach your horse that a release of pressure comes, a complete release of pressure comes when your horse gets that answer right. So when your horse um, finds the correct response in movement. And that for, really for me is the most important thing. So I always start there. So once we've got the horse going with give to the bit and softness in the bridle, we can then move on and do the shoulder control and, you know, which again starts on the ground and it's all about the bridle work, the shoulder control. It's still, you know, getting the horse to respond to the bridle properly. Um, but now we've got the horse in that engagement zone and we've really started to teach the horse and to build that bubble of communication. And that's what makes it so much easier for the horse, just by being able to get the horse into the engagement zone and keep the horse there really does help the horse. So keeping you on the ground here, we, we move through to the long and the short reining. Now, once you've got the horse working in that bubble of communication, if we come to you know, people that are worried about training their own horses, especially with starting the horses, because you know, I, I have a lot of people that um, come to me and sort of say, oh, look, I've done all the hard work. I've done all the basic stuff. He just needs his first ride now. Now, you know, and they bring the horse to me to have the first ride. And I'm like, well, why are you doing that? Because there's obviously something not right. Because if you have done all the work yourself, you know what your horse is capable of. You know what sort of um, behaviours your horse might come up with. You've seen the horse and you've felt the horse with the long reins and all the groundwork you've done. You've obviously been through the first saddling. The horse has had a saddle on. And so if you're not desperate to have that first ride yourself, having done all that hard work, that should tell you something. 
Um, and that should tell you that your horse isn't ready and your you subconsciously know that your horse isn't ready. So you know there's a hole in your training. Short reining is a lovely step between long reining and riding. Um, and, you know, the you'll find this very useful. It's a great place to get your horse um, going from walk to trot. You know, when you the first couple of rides, you might want to take a few trot strides. So you want to make sure that your horse is responding to a nice verbal cue for trot so that you can do that. And this is, you know, you're very close to being actual riding the horse when you're doing something like short reining, which is um, really, really useful. So, you know, those sorts of things. And I think, you know, coming back to Robin's question about why people are so reluctant to train their own horses, I think it's because they haven't got these tools. Um, screen sharing, sorry, I'm going to come back from screen sharing. Here we go. I think it's because they haven't got the tools. And, you know, it is scary to do something if you don't know how to do it. And that's what happened to me, you know, when I was in Singapore and I had this horse that was um, really nervous and, you know, very flighty and I had to hold together and all of those things. It was scary for me to think that I could train it because I didn't have any tools to do that. So I ended up, you know, spending eight months in Colorado learning how to train my own horse. I then came back from Colorado and, you know, went to the UK. I was three years in the UK training other people's horses. And when I moved back to Australia, and I'm native Australian, moved back to Australia and I thought, yeah, you know, that's great. And I started working. I was actually going to sort of retire, to be honest with you. I was going to just sort of enjoy my life and my horses in rural Australia. And people kept saying to me, oh, could you just teach my horse to do this? Could you just do that with my horse? And I was going, yeah, 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 can do, can do. And eventually I was like, oh, this is ridiculous, you know, I'm actually working much harder than I've worked before, um, just doing, you know, things for mates. So I decided, well, that's that's crazy. What I really need to do is start teaching people to train their own horses so I don't have to go out and teach them all. So I started doing that. And what I found was that was amazing because it's so much better to teach the people to train their horses than it is to do it yourself because they love it. They absolutely love it. They're, you know, every day I get emails from people saying, oh, guess what I did? I taught my horse hips to fence or I taught my horse to do this or whatever it is. And it's fantastic. And just to empower people like that and to make them realise that they can teach their horse and they can do it ethically and they can do it nicely and the horse can love it and they'll love it. Um, it is absolutely wonderful. And so I decided a couple of years ago that, that was it. No more, I'm not taking any more horses in for training. That, but I will happily do my very best to teach you how to train your own horse. Because I think that those are the tools that people are missing. And I think there's a, you know, a lot of, you know, stuff out there that is, is a little bit helpful. But at the end of the day, you need to be able to break it down yourself and you need to know that it's um, ethical and sustainable training. You really do. And so with that in mind, after I'd moved back to Australia about six years ago, I started reading some of the science um, behind horse training. And equitation science was very young at that stage, but I started reading up about that and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. And I read an article that I actually really didn't like at all and didn't think was very good. So I thought, oh, I need to write an article about that um, to say that that wasn't very good. Um, and that led me to where I am now. That actually led me to five years of doing a um, equine science degree, undergraduate degree with an honours degree. And now I'm halfway through my PhD, which is in horse training and welfare. And the reason that I got to this stage was because I got a bit tired of saying, oh, this is what I find. What I find works best is to engage the horse with learning. What I find works best is I'd actually wanted to show that scientifically that that was best or that was the best way of doing it. So that's where I am now and I'm halfway through 
my PhD. I've just published um, a paper recently, this one, which I was showing those of you that watched last week. This is um, about an experiment that I did, which was all about give to the bit. That was what we used um, to engage the horse with learning. And this is where I um, actually came up with that term, the engagement zone, which is that zone where the horse is more emotional than it would be if it was standing around in a paddock and less emotional than it would be if it was frightened. It's that where the horse is engaged. So like that student in the classroom that's really enjoying the lesson and really getting into it and you've got a teacher that's telling a great story, just like that student, that's the student we want our horses to be. That's the type of teacher we want to be for our horses. And that is the engagement zone. And that's where all of the can-do training is focused getting your horse into that engagement zone, breaking down the lesson so that you know exactly what you're teaching your horse and why you're teaching your horse that. And what I find with people is that their riding comes along as their training does. So if, if you start off as you know a pretty inexperienced rider and you start training your horse on the ground, you do the give to the bit work and the shoulder control and the long reining and the hind quarter and you do all of the stuff on the ground, you start riding it, you actually do it, you've got to focus. You're moving the horse's feet around, you're using pressure release with the horse, you're rewarding the horse, using positive and negative reinforcement and you're focused on that. Absolutely, your riding will come along in leaps and bounds and you won't even realise it. If your riding's already brilliant, it's just going to get so much better because your horse is going to be moving so much better and it's going to be so much more relaxed and focused with you. So I don't fuss too much about riding initially. You know, you can be great, you can be not so good. Get that horse, get yourself thinking about training the horse because that is the important thing. You know, if your horse is tense, if your horse has its um, back hollow and it's pounding around on the forehand, anything like that, it you know, you're never going to do a nice sitting trot. doesn't matter how well you ride. You know, the horse isn't going properly. So you can get your horse to relax. If you can get your horse into the engagement zone, if you can get your horse engaged with learning, everything else will follow. I do think that's the place to start. Um, and so that is me. That is where Can Do Equine is coming from. I will tell you also um, that next month, uh, yeah, next month, um, halfway through the month, I am coming out with some training videos and something really exciting. I am actually really excited about that. So um, look out in, the, in a couple of weeks' time, there's going to be a series of three or four training videos um, that will be available to everyone online free and um, I've got something else coming out in December that I'm very excited about. So we'll find out a bit more about that soon as well. And thank you for coming today and I will see you on Facebook Live. Otherwise, I will see you next week here. All right, bye.